So he was a 50 years old male and he had cervical PID, C5, C6 with neurological deficit. He had myelopathic uh, signs and you can see the significantly compressed spinal cord there. And uh, a straightforward case it appeared to and we went, we did discectomy and fusion and we used to put uh, only the bone graft because there was no instability and we never plated such patient earlier. This is, uh, I am talking about uh, in 94, 95. So, so, everything was fine. Then he took full diet till 7th post-operative day. On 8th post-operative day, he had dysphagia, odinophagia and neck swelling. And we took the plain x-ray, you can see the pre vertebral shadow earlier was like, and now it has appeared like. So there is a significant increase in the size of this pre vertebral shadow and that created a doubt. So two stitches were opened up and there was a mucopurulent frothy discharge. The methylene blue test uh, was positive. We used to put uh, you know in the uh, oropharynx and since we have opened the wound there that the methylene blue it came out through the wound. So there was a staining there. So it was confirmed that this is esophageal perforation and uh, general surgeon's opinion was taken and he advised re-exploration and the general surgeon came and uh, started doing this. So there was a disaster during re-exploration. So search of minor leak there was a 2 centimeter tear because you know 7th, 8th day the edema is there in searching that you know uh, there was 2 centimeter of the opening. And the general surgeon planned a diversion at a later date. He put rice tube in the distal esophagus through the neck wound. Antibiotics and dressing continued for four days. And these four days was four decades for me. And it was very agonizing and it was a rough phase of my life. The patient physical agony was significant. He has significant odinophagia. Deglutition of saliva was impossible and there was excessive salivation. So at the head end of the, his bed, there are a lot of gauze pieces kept. He used to just wipe continuously. On 13th post-operative day, he developed toxic symptoms. That was the fifth day of the re-exploration and he died on 14th post-operative day, the sixth day of re-exploration. Now death is a, co a known complication though it is not very common but if you don't take care they die of different issues. So it is very important to know what are the different causes and how to prevent them that is very important. So the early causes are iatrogenic so injury during intubation or nasogastric tube insertion. So we know these are the two important area which is well described in literature that is Killian's dehiscence and the V-shaped area of the lamar. So here what happened between the cricopharyngeus proximally there is a narrow space where the muscles are not much. Even below that where there is the area of lamar that is also deficient in that area. So very, very thin layer of esophagus is there and that is the common site of actually perforation. Injury during surgery, so these are the things which can happen, your uh, burr might slip, you might cauterize while putting the even drain tube. Sometimes you have habit of cutting the drain tube obliquely, so that pointed edge can lead to the late uh, injury. And sometimes when you use this, uh, uh, you know, Casper retractor, this retractor it comes out and suddenly your, you know, assistant he presses. If there is a nearby esophagus it will be crushed. Always try to cover the esophagus either with a very good retractor. I usually put nowadays the, that gauze piece. You can see the wet gauze piece uh, which is covering the esophagus. Never the di direct pressure. And the core part of your retractor should be lying beneath the longus coli muscle. So that is extremely important. Now esoph esophageal wall ischemia can happen. This happened usually in late leak which was in this case, in my case where it happened after uh, seven days. So this is because of the pressure necrosis. In the late we are aware that all these prominent implant, backed out implant and graft can lead to pressure necrosis and there may be esophageal leak. Now this is very important, I stress this point. Sometime you deal with the traumatic cervical column injury 
and you don't think about you go ahead and you do the fixation but sometimes there is a pre-existing esophageal injury also when this trauma of the cervical column has happened so I had a case I will be showing that so it is the initial trauma and the literature of is full of this post-traumatic uh, cervical uh, column injury leading to esophageal injury and all these cases are well uh, mentioned in the literature so what is the common scenario you get a cervical spine fracture or fracture dislocation and patient comes to you with the quadriparesis or plagia so it reduces you decompress and you stabilize but post-operative what you find sometimes there is a wound essence and you think this is the post-operative infection and uh, you start tackling that part thinking a simple wound infection or sometimes the patients uh, become toxic, they have bad chest and he dies and you think this is the actually sequelae of quadriplegia, there is a respiratory paralysis and you think that because of that he died. But sometimes the minor leak might go unnoticed unless you pay attention to these patients. Now, this is the patient which uh, you know uh, presented to who presented to us and you can see this is the extension type of injury there was a cord injury edema was there there is a hyper extension injury and we plated and he had this leak because there is a swelling which appeared in the neck area this is the barium solo and this short clear cut leak there okay and now you see we went again to its images and you see this piece has actually caused trauma to the MR, you can see in the MRI, esophagus, it is nicely visible here, but we did not notice it prior, it was noticed later on when he started subsequently searching the thing. The cause of death is usually mediastinitis, septicemia or meningitis. The incidence of perforation is 0 0.02 to 1.49 percent, but if it happens, it can lead to mortality from 6 to 18 percent, they have very high mortality if it happens. Okay. And how will you manage these cases? Approach to such a case, you have to have uh, the diagnosis, you have to confirm it with this methylene blue test or you do contrast esophagography, even the CT can help you, you will find the air shadow in the surrounding area and endoscopic examination, it, it, you can have the clearly visible things if it already perforated and you can see this, all these things have been mentioned in the literature quite widely. And sometime while if you are exploring it is better to put uh, rice through the rice tube or some tube Interoperatively you can detect the tear the methylene will, will start coming from that part Okay, so uh, this makes everything simple Now what is the treatment of this perforation? It is controversial Aggressive versus uh, conservative and highly case specific it will depend what is the situation and uh, most of the time you will be able to uh, actually control it and treat it nicely. So when you are going to treat it or consider treatment by conservative means, if the defect is contained or there is a no mean uh, or no contamination of the pleural area or mediastinum and there is no signs of uh, septicemia, the defect is very minor you can treat it uh, conservatively by stopping the oral feed. You start rice tube feeding, high calorie uh, diet is to be given to through this tube. You can put egg chips and protein and all this. Never through the neck, which was done earlier. It is never to be done. Intravenous sensitive antibiotic is started, mostly the broad spectrum antibiotic. Do the liberal wound drainage. You just keep it open, everything will come out. Since you have stopped the oral feed, it it heals very nicely now in this case the second case which I showed this healed uh, very nicely then you do the close keep the patient under observation maybe after a week or so you start but don't start liquid start with the semi solid that patient used to take a lot of biscuits okay and uh, you know you can ask him to take even chapati after proper chewing so that area is still draining so you keep it is under it is under observation if something is coming so first you start uh, semi solid and start liquid after two weeks and it heals nicely what is the surgical treatment primary repair should be done by the first surgeon who has operated because you know the plane properly if you wish to call some gi surgeon it is better you also be there so that you can guide him also and you can do the f uh, flap reinforcement after suturing the wall of the esophagus and that 
uh, you know, different uh, nearby muscles which can be utilized. The sternocleidomastoid is used very commonly. You can use the longus coli. And there are other all uh, different uh, muscles which are nearby can be utilized. In the literature, the use of jejunum, omentum, pleura, platysma, all these things have been actually described and has been used. So this is a very common thing, sternocleidomastoid. In that case, we did it. So you have to just turn the sternocleidomastoid part, part of it, you turn from here because the attachment is from sternum to mastoid process. So you turn it, bring it there and put on that suture part. So this is a, a flap which is covering that area. You can also use pectoralis major flap and uh, this most of the time it heals and there is not a problem. So I'll conclude the high suspicion, early detection and prompt treatment. Usually you will get this fruitful outcome in a case of esophageal perforation. The suspicion is extremely important and I think if you have a close observation there should not be any problem. I thank you very much for your kind attention.